Welcome to the Rising Tide Podcast with D. Klein and Eric P. Rhodes. Each week, the Rising Tide Podcast brings you the latest stories from a world where art, technology, and culture converge. Ride the wave of the future with us. The tide is rising, and the possibilities are endless. Right on, Eric. Good morning. For what you. a week. What a week. Woo! Yeah, seriously. How long after our recording did this whole assassination attempt happen? It was hours later, wasn't it? Yes. Because I remember we recorded last week's episode. We always record on Saturdays, release on Mondays. And often there's weird things that have been happening <laughs> hours following our recordings. You know? <laughs> I'm not saying that we are arbiters of culture or <laughs> effectors of change, but uh, we're definitely something. That's for sure. We're something. <laughs> that is true. I'll agree with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. Uh, my mom came like running down and she was like, did you hear what happened? And then it, I spent the next, well, first of all, I clicked through all the media, you yeah. know, the to see who was saying what. The headlines were hilarious. Okay. Um, NBC had something like Secret Service rushes. As Trump rushes falls Trump, on stage or something like rushes that. Rushes Trump off stage as he falls or something along those lines. You know, uh, there was another one that was saying there were popping noises. That was CNN. Okay. Um, so I mean, like, you to could... be fair, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna defend these guys here, even though I know they're ridiculous. Uh, when That's I fair. was when I was writing as a journalist, you had to make sure that your facts were straight before you would say something like as dramatic as assassination attempt. Um, okay. Uh, and you had to make sure that facts had been like corroborated by a number of sources before you would go ahead and put something that dramatic as a headline to say that he there was an attempted assassination. If this so was I can 19... see why they were playing it a bit cautiously. Again, mm -hmm. I think their coverage of it, the whole thing was completely comically bad. Don't get me don't like I'm super mm -hmm. defensive of CNN and NBC because they were ridiculous. But I can see where that came from in those first. Now, having said that, it took them some time. I don't know if they ever actually used the words assassination attempt in a headline on those outlets. I'm not sure. I never followed uh, up. Eventually, they did across okay. all across like. And how um, long did that take for those? You know, uh, like a day. Okay, it was like quite a, day. a long time. Yeah. When I was cutting you off so unfairly about because I wanted to react to it was uh if this was 1996 news media i would agree with you yeah this is 2024 news media where they care about clicks and cycles it so it was a long time you're right so it was clearly a choice it was clearly a choice not to use those words yes you know and then you have people on you have you have um citizen journalists and independent journalists you could always i feel like i could always tell the difference between the two uh -huh. the citizen journalists are the other people who are afraid to say assassination or shot with a gun on social media so they say pew pew mm -hmm. and attempted to like um uh what's unalive him <laughs> if we could say the words assassinate we could say the word gun on social media it's not going to get you banned like um these are you you're self-censoring and it's ridiculous mm. so i feel like that there's a, a spectrum here that happens but then the independent journalist which is where i got a lot of my uh information from which is really interesting because on social media outlets like facebook and others things were either not making it there or being pulled down quickly now i know how this happens on the back end after having worked at twitter 
everything gets f- flagged really quickly mm-hmm. uh puts basically gets put in a bucket and then somebody reviews mm-hmm. it right. and and it can go up so this is why back in the day you used to be able to see not that you wanted to see this but things like beheadings and uh as awful as they were uh uh things like um people attempting to rape Just other people terrible things yeah That's awful things would views. make it to yeah. twitter and then eventually they created ml and you know the the back end where it gets bucketed mm-hmm. the difference is you can choose the severity to which things that are being bucketed get bucketed okay right and so essentially if uh, there's any mention of like trump and assassination it's a video it could be put in a bucket and not and not put up Hmm. right if they choose to do so um and these things can either be changed on a fly or uh or updated as they need to right twitter did a really good job for a while of allowing um content to be found and Hmm. i found and saved so much content that didn't make it to news media until the next day uh information that the dude was a Republican. Also, people are saying that he, um, um, he paid fifteen dollars in twenty twenty one for twenty twenty uh, at the, for pack, Biden's think, election. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The problem is that's actually another Thomas from Pittsburgh. Oh, really? Yeah, who's sixty nine years old. Yeah, another Thomas Crooks from Pittsburgh who's 69 years old. So, like, all of these things are findable. Uh, you have to dig deep because the, the traditional journalists aren't going to give it to you. Anyway, that's my spiel. Well, you know, what I found was this proved that Twitter is, or X, is the best place to go if you actually want the actual news that's happening as it's happening. Now, some of Real it's time. false. Yeah. Some of it's misleading. You know, and you have to be wise about it and discerning, which is mm-hmm. what should be the case, you know, because there are people putting out stuff that's just ridiculous, you know, in order to get clicks. Um, and some of it gets um, momentum and there will be little stories coming out about it that turn out to be completely untrue uh, because of that. But if you just take the time to look and go, okay, what are the sources for this? And look at, okay, who's corroborating this? And where else is this showing up? You can pretty quickly figure out if it's got some authenticity to it or not, rather than waiting for it to get filtered down to, say, CNN or NBC or Fox or whoever, who's going to put a spin on it. And I mean, that's the thing nowadays, of course, everybody has a phone now. So you've got everybody recording video of this incident um and some of the footage is amazing some of the footage there was one that was called the worst selfie of all time where the guy is at the rally and he turns around the camera to himself and he's filming himself and that's when the shots go off and so he misses the entire thing right you know things like that which were kind of comical but uh there's a lot of footage that you would see there that just doesn't make its way to the mainstream news no um, and, you know, you end up being far more knowledgeable about the situation, but you do have to be careful to not, when you first see something, go, oh, see, this water tower with this person on it, turns out it's a star logo on the water tower. The confirmation you know, bias. In, in a grainy video, and people are like, see, there's somebody on the water tower. It's like, no, that's just a really low quality video with a star logo on it. Now, having said that, I don't actually know for it with certainty whether or not there was somebody on that tower. But <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, you have to kind of, you know, filter through, the, through this stuff. But to me, that's a far better source of news as it's happening than waiting for these news outlets to put their own little spin on it. I think day one of any event, it's it's a really good outlet. Um uh, mm-hmm. Day two is when conspiracy theorists right. and people who are botting right. or companies who are botting information uh, sort of try to attempt to gain control of the narrative. Mm-hmm. And so it's harder, I think, to sift through all of that. Yeah. Well, and it becomes or day more and zero, more really. as the days go on. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Really, I mean, day zero. So like 
as the event is happening, X is really the place to go, as you pointed out. Mm-hmm. Um, the conspiracy theorists are hilarious. I mean, like, there are people who, who are going, like I was saying about confirmation bias, they're going to find the information they want to find that corroborates what they already believe to be the story or want to believe to be the story, that it was an FBI fix. Like they're saying that the director of the FBI was in the background giving a signal mm-hmm. and they're using grainy images of that woman. You could find high def images of that woman. Number one. Number two, you can find a two day v- a picture of the assistant director of the FBI who is uh, looks nothing like the woman. I know the, the woman you're talking about. You have to admit, she acted extremely suspiciously. Okay, yeah, fine. But I mean, like she's turning, looking exactly where the shooter is. Moments before she lowers herself down, gunshots go off. She holds up her phone. She doesn't, everyone else is like ducking in the bleachers as she just holds up her phone and starts recording. It's like, who is this? What is she? Well, if you zoom out, not everybody ducks. Uh, some True. people are standing up and pointing. True. And there are um, other people looking to their right as well because yeah. something's happening over there, not just the shooter on the roof. Yeah, the, a, a dude got hit and was dying, protecting his wife. Wow, and, this was before gunshots. People daughter. were off to their right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but look, so I can see why people would come to that conclusion. Like, oh, this person is in on it, is all I'm saying. Sure. But, but there are people who of... whip out their phones and film stuff all the time in terrible situations. Yeah, and some people don't know what gunshots sound like and just might think it's firecrackers okay. and aren't afraid of, you know, might be just pops, right? Because they're at a rally and things, people might be shooting fireworks. So who knows? You can't just assume everybody is going to, especially when it comes to like conspiracy theory, suspicious activity. You can't just assume everybody's going to act the same. You don't know. You know, she was looking in a direction, but the, it, her eyes can span, mm-hmm. you know, this Short, much. A huge, a huge range. Yeah, a huge yeah. distance. Field of view, yeah. So it's like, I don't know. Like there's no evidence to support. To me, it, the so. wildest conspiracy conspiracy theory actually came from the left, that the thing was staged. Now I know initially, even yeah. I would message you, I was like, "Hmm, I wonder if this was staged." And then it's like, "Okay, but wait a minute. Think about it for just a moment. Yeah. Think about what it would take to deliberately shoot and just graze Trump's ear." Or some people are saying he didn't even get hit at all by a bullet. He just cut his ear or something or oh, there splash, is a splash some fake blood on his face or whatever there is a high def uh slow down image where you see a hole get exposed in his ear someone Just was like, filming from back b- behind him like that yeah there were lots of people filming behind okay. him wild so they've got point point got... being for that to be staged okay yeah. first of all somebody did die like there was a, a firefighter, Corey Comparator, Compar- Compar- yes. Com- you know, Com- who did Comparator. die. Yeah. Comparator, yeah. Right. There were two others who were seriously injured. Yeah. So you're going to tell me that they're going to stage that, you know, like, and, oh, hey, I'm just going to just clip Trump's ear to make it look like I was trying to kill him as he turns his head for a fraction of a second that we couldn't possibly synchronize with each other. It's impossible to stage it. Like, that was such a ludicrous story. And it was just funny because it was coming from the left side that generally is highly critical of conspiracy theories. And here comes this, yeah. it was all staged story, it, it, which is completely ridiculous when you think about it. They That was reactive, I think, because... That was a reactive uh, conspiracy theory, I I believe, because they they were. I think a lot of people assumed that the shooter was going to be a Democrat, right? And that was going to just set everything off. People were talking about civil war. We're not even, ladies and gentlemen, we have we have we have been able to handle assassinations of presidents throughout our history. Uh. uh 
actual assassinations and attempts of presidents throughout our history without going into civil war. Mm -hmm. We would have been fine. Mm -hmm. It would have sucked. We were not, if he would have died, we were not going to go into civil war. Like, not even close. Um, anyway, what was I saying? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Did you see this thing about this company, Austin Private Wealth LLC, that shorted uh, Donald J. Trump's Truth Social stock? Like, oh, like the day 12 before? 12 million shares the day before. Yeah. And then after he didn't get killed, they're like, oh, sorry, that was just a clerical error. You know, <laughs> that to me was like, apparently they all, they all, there was also shorts on Rumble as well, which is generally a right wing uh, social media platform. And apparently there's some connection to the Bush family. I don't know what, exactly with the Austin private wealth. I don't know the whole story. Uh, don't quote me on that. But there's something to do with uh, the person who posted about this goes by the ex champagne Joshi or Josh Wacko's. And he kind of digs into it. You can look up their profile to see all the details. And I'm no expert on this, so don't quote me on any of this. But you wonder, like, oh, so was it some of the other Republicans? You're never Trump or other Republicans who are Republican, but they don't want Trump to be the guy. I mean, sure. There's but plenty of Republicans who hate Trump. Don't, don't. People make... It's so easy to go down conspiracy like Austin, sure. Texas, well, sure, knew and they were in cahoots. Like, uh, let's just make one up. This Austin, Texas, well, knew because they were in cahoots with the director of the FBI, who somehow uh, facilitated a way for a 20 year old Republican shooter who just missed Trump's ear but killed two other people. Uh, but it's all a conspiracy. I think the more likely scenario is an unhinged dude who had access to a gun saw an opportunity to take out a president and there was a security gaffe. I'll call it a guy. It's a security fuck up. But if, again, if you do research, you learn who has responsibilities outside of the secure area, right? And it was, yes, the Secret Service are 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 responsible for what happens inside the secure area, but local police are responsible for for outside of the secure area. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you there, though. Sure. Okay, I was at a golf. I was with a friend golfing at a driving range yeah. the other day. 150 yards. You can hit that with a nine iron, dude. 150 yeah. yards is nothing. I looked at the 150 yard mark. I'm like, holy shit. That's how far away that sloped roof was where this guy was on. That to, for that to not be within the Secret Service's secured area is completely oh, yeah, I'm not defending ludicrous. Mm -hmm. I'm not defending their uh, they their, saw their him fucker. walking around with a rangefinder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's who's using a rangefinder at a rally for any reason but to shoot somebody? They he flew a drone over the site before the I'll, incident. I'll, I will. There were I'll people ask, yelling about him being there for multiple correct. minutes. Yes. Well, I'll ask you this. Imagine we know this knowing that he was the attempted assassin now. So that's with hindsight. Mm -hmm. Imagine hypothetically Secret Service takes out an unarmed man with a gun. Unarmed man with a gun? That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. I, I meant takes out this uh, this man who's unarmed and has a range finder. No, no, no. You wouldn't take him out, but you would go and apprehend him and sure. say, sorry, you get, get the hell out of here. You can't be here. Sure. Uh, my I, I point agree. is, my point is, I agree. People are, people are talking about firing the Secret Services director. I'm sorry, but firing these people is not enough. At the very least, this is criminal negligence. At the least, yeah, criminal there negligence. Was major security fuck up potentially sure. deliberate negligence in my opinion i don't know if it was deliberate i'm uh, saying at the least it's criminal negligence sure so yeah. they should not only be fired they should be charged we're not gonna i don't think we're gonna see that but um 
like seriously, dude, 150 yards is nothing. Yeah, a, a lot of things come into question. <laughs> a lot of things come into question. But we have the benefit of hindsight knowing that he not a, knowing that he wasn't just suspicious but he was the actual assassin now. Of course. In the moment in we have to we have to consider that in the moment these decisions are being looked through with a different lens. Also, if you consider the sloped edge, right, where he was was behind the sloped edge. So depending on anyway, lots of lots of things we lots of information we don't have access to. Well, there's also the scenario. I'm gonna interrupt you again. You have two contradicting arguments again from Cheetah. Yeah. Okay. First of all, you have one of the arguments was Oh, this was an area the local officers were supposed to cover. And then you right. also have her saying, um, oh, well, we didn't have anyone on there because the roof was sloped, so we had people inside the building. So it's like, well, which one is it? Was it under your jurisdiction for you to then determine, no, we're not going to put someone on the roof? Right. Or was yeah. it local enforcement's jurisdiction? In which case, why yeah. did you have to decide whether or not someone should be on a slope roof that was not under your purview? Yeah, like I'm sorry. They're, absolute negligence. Oh, crap, man. They're yeah. they're lying about stuff. I'm sorry. I, I I feel like there was some deliberate negligence there. I, I I would I would agree. I think they're lying about stuff, but I think they're lying to see to cover their ass, not because of a cover up. I don't know, man. You know what are they going to cover? I don't know. You know, I just the simplest this. The simplest solution is almost always the right one. It reminds me of, uh, of course, I'm sure many of other people have been reminded of JFK's assassination. Yeah. And there was uh, Secret Service protection, of course, in place. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, like, for example, where there's Secret Service on the vehicle, there's supposed to be two Secret Service people at the back of the car. Yeah. And for whatever reason, off. for yeah. whatever reason, the one dude on the right side at the back got waved off. No explanation. Open up yeah. a wide open angle for a shot. Not having that Secret Service person there. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. Like, no, no, I agree. I, you know, could be, could be coincidental, could not be. But you also have to, you know, The shot that Lee Harvey Oswald took, uh, I would say, was um, a little bit more skilled than oh. this one. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, if if you listen to the audio, he rang out at first three pops and then multiple. It sounds like five more, and then he was done. Mm -hmm. Right? They got him. Um, some people are theorizing there was another shooter as well. I don't know anything to back that up, except for that there was some audio analysis of one shot that sounded different, but that would have been in addition to the final shot that took out the gunman. I mean, there was another shot that sounded different. Yeah, well, the, the assumption is that the story is that one bullet from a sniper rifle took this guy out. I don't know if I believe that. I mean, maybe there was a bullet from the sniper rifle and other agents taking people out, mm -hmm. taking the dude out. Uh, again, there's a lot of this that we have where con it's conjecture because we, sure. we don't have the evidence. How and injured do you think Trump's ear is? This is another thing I was hearing from leftists was like, ah, oh, they yeah. barely grazed him. It's like, guys, they tried to kill him and it just barely missed killing him by practically i mean some people would say it was a miracle okay if you're it not was, religious yeah. you would say a statistical improbability he he moved his head a direction at the right moment at 50th of a second or something yeah. like that difference something i don't know what the number was 20th well like i was sharing a tiny earlier, fraction of time there is video from that side where it slowed down and you see his ear. You don't see the bullet because the bullet's obviously moving at a higher rate of than the frames are, um, than the FPS. But it, you you see his ear, 
and then you see his ear get pulled, and then a hole opens up in his ear. And it's I like, mean, it was like Mark Zuckerberg was saying, like, the, the it was such a badass move when he got back up and raised his fist, right? You know, like that was like wow. Right. And of course, the people who hate Trump, they see that and go, oh, what an idiot standing up and raising his fist. It's like, no, that was cool, man. Like, I'm sorry. Totally. But that was cool. (laughs) That fueled the conspiracy. He knew he was going to get shot, blah, blah. First of all, he (laughs) let's let's you're in the moment. Adrenaline's up. You just been shot. Secret Service are pouncing on top of you. Nobody in the world but 42 other men, uh, 42. 46 other men know what that's like to be jumped on top of by Secret Service agents. Hmm. Nobody else in the world. Right? In that in the U in the US, anyway, let's say. Sure. Uh, instead of the world. Because yeah, yeah. That's that's a little I hyperbolic. But I'm trying to make a point. Everybody's talking about it's just like you say, it's just in here. Nobody's talking about what he came within micro inches of his life. Yeah. I just don't get it how you can downplay that. And you then can't. you get you get Joy Reid on NBC saying, well, Biden getting over COVID, that's kind of like the same thing, right? <laughs> He's going to be like, fight, we Dude. fight, we fight COVID. <laughs> he gets Dude over a cold. That's kind of like getting shot in the head, right? Yeah. Listen, Biden's cooked. <laughs> He's cooked. Uh, did you see? I saw. I saw someone who, after after Reagan's assassination attempt, I saw some data that forty nine of the fifty states all voted for right. Yeah, Reagan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he was president at the time, though. So. Yeah, it was incumbent. Yeah, it was for yeah. a second term. Yep. So you know, a little bit different. I do think that this swayed a lot of people. Um, I I, dude, I was impressed. I mean, I'm Canadian, so I don't get the vote, but yeah, I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, when you Trump stood who... up and raised his fist, I was like, "Wow!" You know, because yeah. there would have been a lot of people before that moment who'd, who'd say, "Oh, Trump is a coward," blah 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 blah. You know, and you think, "Okay, well, then he didn't stay on the ground cowering and sh- and crawl his way out of there." Right, he got back up and raised his fist. Yeah. Right, and he was like, "Fight, fight, fight," which is like, ah. you know, that whole "oh, Trump's a coward" argument kind of goes out the window, then, doesn't it? Uh, and the other piece of this too is <laughs> he does not have to do this. No, <laughs> he is right. not a career politician. He mm-hmm. was already the president of the United States. He could have dropped out after this if he wanted to. I mean, his ego probably won't. You let could him. say he is an ego maniac, though. Yeah, sure. But what what man that wants to reach the highest uh, position in our land uh, isn't it, to some degree? Of course. Yeah, I yeah, I'm just saying, like, my impression of Trump changed after that when he sure. got up. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of American voters, too. I was uh, I was in touch with some people immediately after it, um, and they said uh this is and this was before a lot of the information came out uh-huh. and immediately they were they're they're republican and they immediately go to the democrats hate him this is all the rhetoric da, 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 da. i just turned around to them and i said listen we can't immediately blame all liberals right this. you uh-huh. just can't no um and then it turns out it doesn't matter if you blame the liberals because it wasn't a liberal that did it Um, As far as we know. As far as we know. Look, it could have been, they. you start to hear all the things. Maybe he registered a Republican to vote against Trump. Mm -hmm. Hypothetical, possible. Mm -hmm. Um, His his father was registered as a libertarian. Um, Is that right? (laughs) Yeah, as far as I, in my research, again, I hope people do more. Um, I stopped after a while. I I had researched enough to to know that this was super complicated, as any assassination would be. Of course, um, you know. But the news cycle's funny, isn't it? Uh, almost like two days later, it's the it's no longer the the leading story. 
Mm -hmm. You know? Well, the pro dem or dem funded media, Democrat funded media is going to try to bury the story as fast as they can because it gives so much momentum to Trump, of course. Uh, fast forward, though, to the RNC and Trump's speech, which I watched because I was really curious how he was going to respond to the situation. Yeah. And first 15 minutes or so, it was like, huh, this is really good. He was like, you know, talking about his experience with the assassination attempt. He talked about like things like, uh, I'm only here by the grace of God, which, of course, mm -hmm. Republicans love that. He, oh, the, the evangelicals were eating that up. Sure. He was a very respectful commemoration to uh, Corey Comparator. Is that his name? Is that yeah, the, the Comparator. Yeah. No, very respectful. Very, um, I was impressed. I was like, wow. Okay, now stop. Right? Like, accept the nomination and walk off the stage. Yeah. At, but he just can't help himself. Yeah, but they love it. I know, but if he had just done the 15 20 minute speech where he talked about that and he's and he talked about unifying the country he talked about we're going to win together not just 50 percent of the country but i want everyone to win together you know and thanking everybody who was there yeah. and uh honoring i thought that the, was a good line it was and honoring the cory comparator and those things it was fantastic and it's mm -hmm. like okay now just say i accept the nomination and walk off the stage but instead he had to get into all of this ridiculous oh uh, it just was like what are you doing man it was so good and then he just sounded ridiculous after that for a good hour like talking about hannibal lecter being a cannibal and that was that was great character and stuff. i was like what are you doing oh i i turned it actually that's funny i turned it i didn't realize he well, I guess he went I for an hour and a half. He talked for an hour and a half. It's the longest acceptance speech in history. He must really love to hear himself talk. So yeah. I stopped. Yeah, I stopped listening uh, after after he did the Hulkster. That was great. The, the Hulk was giving him <laughs> the great. the kisses. After well, that, yeah. I was like, no, I, the Hulk Hogan speech was hilarious. I love that. Oh uh, yeah, but well, there was uh, the shirt. <laughs> I mean, you know, he lost some strength because he couldn't rip that shirt off. He was off. struggling to rip the shirt off. <laughs> <The> cotton <laughs> tea. <laughs> some people were a little offended because his original shirt had an American flag on it that he tore up. It was an I am a real American. It's his branded mm -hmm. stuff. I'm just from saying. WWE. Some people didn't like that. Come on. Get over <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> It's the Hulkster. He rips <laughs> shirts off. My That's point, what okay, he does. Back to my point, though, okay? Trump's speech, now granted, yeah. it was on a teleprompter, and for the first 10, 15 minutes, he kind of stuck to that. Good. And that was yeah. good. It was great. Like, yeah. it was the best Trump speech in his history of ever having speeches, because most of his speeches are completely ridiculous. Yeah, okay? it was very controlled. Um, and it was very, like, it was like, wow, this is a new man, yeah. you know? Like he's seen the light, so to speak, you know. He would he would have locked it. He would have locked up both sides after that fifteen oh, minutes. Oh man! If he'd have just walked off the stage at that point, the Dems would have been like, "Holy crap, we are toast." Yeah. Right. But then when he he went back into all of his just ridiculous comments and, uh, you know, anti-immigration stuff, which you know, okay, Republicans, you're for border control. I get that totally. But he didn't just stay, say that. He was talking about how all these other countries are sending criminals to the states and da da da, da Right. Right. And El Salvador is terrible because they're just taking the criminals and sending them to us and right stuff like that. Where you're like, what are you doing, man? And that's where Democrats were like breathing a sigh of relief because they're like, oh, he's back to his old antics. He's not a changed man. Right. But his base loves that. So oh, absolutely. But I'm saying my point being, anyone. he was a he was acquiring a broader base with that speech. And yeah. after those first 20 minutes, those people who are like, "Wow, maybe Trump is a changed man. Maybe I will vote for him," if they'd stuck around, they'd be like, "Oh no, he hasn't changed after all. He's the same well, old me, jerk he's always been." Yeah. Let me ask you this: How many of the people how I would love to see the Nielsen metrics of when people dropped off his speech. I, I quit after would... about an hour because I was like, okay, he's just, you know, 
yammering yeah. on now at this point. I think that would be a good metric to see how much of the people that we're we're talking about wouldn't vote for him stopped watching him. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe maybe they stopped after thirty minutes, which maybe they weren't too affected by the rest of his hour the the hour long uh, speech after that. Who knows? You know, the momentum certainly faded after he yeah he cut off yeah. script. Yeah. So yeah, they cause... like they have the teleprompter there with his next point, and then he'd go off script, blah 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 blah, and they just hold the teleprompter for him until he'd return to it, kind of idea. Yeah. And so he'd come up with all these ridiculous comments like, Oh, Hannibal Lecter, wasn't that somebody? Oh, what a great blah blah he's, blah blah blah. It's like what he's a wild card, man. And then he goes he's back to card. man, you know, uh, Taiwan is under attack by China, right after making like a Hannibal Lecter comment. It's like what? <laughs> just really weird stuff. I was a registered independent my entire life, uh-huh. except the first time around um, when Hillary was running against Trump, mm-hmm. and I so did not want Trump. Okay. And so I voted for Hillary. Mm-hmm. Um, I have come around 180 degrees on Trump. I made... Anti-Trump I've come around art. 140 degrees. <laughs> no, what, what I mean by that is like I I can I could see through. I never have liked Hillary Clinton. I wanted her to lose to Trump from the beginning because I oh, just really? can't stand Hillary Clinton. I mean, honestly, I was it was all for the. Uh, I mean, she should have ran on this alone. Would have been great for her to just be the first female president. If they'd have run Joe Biden at that time, Trump never would have been elected president. I don't think Joe was strong enough. Really don't. Better than Hillary Clinton. Everybody hated Hillary. Hillary <laughs> fucked up because she started to she started to uh move go towards identity politics. Uh-huh. Instead of instead of away from it. But she's and... just not a likable figure. Yeah, but people weren't weren't going to vote for her because she was likable. They were going to vote for her for two reasons. One, anti-Trump. Two, first female president. Mm. So do you think that's where Kamala Harris has a chance? Because I just see her being like Hillary, where she's not like- likable. People are not going to vote likeable. for her. No. She, just no. when she talks and laughs, it's like, who are you? Like, you sound like an idiot. I don't know who has a chance coming up on the Dems, uh, but I think this year it's a lock. I think, well, this year it, it's a lock and Trump is going to win. I mean, like whoever you put out there, I don't see how to, he loses. I yeah, I don't. They see have that. to roll Biden out there now because they can't sacrifice anybody else. Are they going to stick to Biden? They. Have I hope to. they do. I hope they do. They have to. <laughs> I hope. I hope they stick with them and just get annihilated. I mean, I. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in Dem country, and this. Uh, my family's fit, about fifty fifty Democrat Republican. Mm-hmm. Um. And we're all, really, we're all just like, can we get some people? Can we get better people than no. than these two options? No, you can't. I, and it's we a can't. race we've to talk, the bottom. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about this. Like your best people aren't going into politics. Exactly. So you're getting the egomaniacs. And so, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about was the good thing about our system is that basically every two years we have the ability to affect change. Mm-hmm. So let's say we're, let's say that Trump gets in and he does some egregious shit. Um, there are opportunities to win seats in Congress and the Senate to affect change pretty quickly sure. in his presidency. So I always thought that that was, you know, one of the benefits of our system is it's, it's not just four years. It's, it's shorter than that. he's got a year and a half, basically, right. where the president is before he has to, you know, before he has to deal with midterm elections. And now so what, that's one to me downside of the American system is that there's just this constant campaigning, like it never stops. Yeah, there's uh, an interesting statistic, and I don't remember exactly what it is, but it was like, um, it was either the Congress, I think, a uh, congressman Mm -hmm. 
Um, they spend 80% of their time uh, campaigning for funds to run again. Right. And 20% of the, yep. yeah, yeah. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. It might be, it might be more, it might be less than that. It might be like 60, but it's substantial my, anyway. It's a, it's way more than it should be. Yeah. This, you know, if you advocate for taking the money out of, out of politics, maybe we might get some better, better people involved. Right. I think lobbyists tend to be, and this is just my own personal belief. Um, I think lobbyists do more to harm the system uh, than they do to benefit, but it's their job to lobby for whatever business that they're being paid to lobby for. So yeah. I get it. The system I mean, allows it. it. Basically allows it to be a corpocracy. It's just operated primarily by corporations, donations, and influence. Totally. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Uh, oh, hey, I got to correct myself. Last week you asked how long a term was for a party in power in Canada. And mm -hmm. I said four years. It was just a brain slip. I realized if, after the crime, I'm like, wait a minute. No, it's a five year maximum, not four. Oh, that's a lot. I mean, yeah. comp compared, you know. But being parliamentary, you often have elections called earlier for numerous reasons. It's yeah. not a fixed date. What I like about the parliamentary system is, is when various parties create coalitions. Mm -hmm. um, I always enjoyed that process. I enjoyed watching it. Um, the notion that these parties have to work together is a positive. Yeah. But you can get locked into uh, a minority party holding the balance of power. And that's what's happening in Canada right now. Yeah. Because the most left wing party with uh, relatively small amounts of seats is enough to cause to contribute to the coalition to make it a majority with just those two parties and they don't really represent the wishes of most canadians yet without them this coalition falls apart so they have a lot of sway over policy mm. even though they don't really reflect the desires of most voters so then in that sense it can be problematic when you get a whole bunch of or when you get multiple parties that don't really represent the majority of voters banding together. Yeah. Well, look, it, no system is going to be perfect. We no. basically run a two party system here. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a multi part, at least a three or four party system. It's going to be, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible um, at this stage. You well, know, to be fair though, you have variances within your parties, which is different from Canadian politics because in the American system, you could be a corporate Democrat or you could be a progressive, for example. You could be um, anti uh, d uh, these big lobbying donors and so forth, or you could be embracing them and be in the same party. Whereas in, totally. Canadian, in Canadian politics, if you're in, say, the Liberal Party, you have to follow the Liberal Party platform. And if you disagree, you got to leave the party. Mm. So it doesn't have the same flexibility which is the reason why there are more parties right but you don't have that same freedom to criticize within a party if you're a part of that party you got to toe the line basically which to me is like but is that really helpful for healthy dialogue then like is that really helpful for moving things forward if the moment you're critical of the official platform you get turfed from the party like it doesn't i don't know that happens to me, here the, too. Yeah, I don't know. It feels to me bit. like the party system, even though there's only two parties in the states, there's more freedom within those part within those parties to dissent, which is a good thing. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I I would agree with that. Yeah. There's a spectrum uh, within each party. They're not hard lines because you have. Sure. I I would say if if you put them on a scale of like let's say Democrat to Republican, right? There are Democrats and Republicans who mostly agree on the same things. Yeah, sure. You know, and they tend to live in this, you know, the, the region that covers where they meet. Yeah. Like uh, you got the corporate Democrats that are getting massive donations from yeah. insurance and from uh, pharma pharmaceuticals and so forth. And they're not that yeah. different from your average Republican. No, no, it's, um, You know, it's really interesting. It's interesting times. Interesting times. 
I don't have anything else to say. You know what I want to say is um, I'm probably saying a lot of wrong shit about American politics and the way <laughs> the system works. And so uh, I apologize. I'm Canadian, so I'm just watching from the outside. Yeah. I apologize in advance if I got any of the any of the social studies aspects of the way that our system, <laughs> no, not social studies. What do they call it? Um, civil civics. Um Oh, and so, so, civics you know, talking about being wrong. accuracy or whatever. You know, I'm just curious, prediction wise. Okay, my prediction as of now is I think Biden, coerced by Jill, they're gonna dig in their heels and they're gonna stick with Biden. What's your prediction? Okay, this is Saturday. We're recording this by Monday. This might be different, but my prediction as of now is Biden sticks with it and goes into the campaign as the presidential candidate because of uh, family advice. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I've I already said it earlier. I think they have to stick with him because they, mm. they either he has to be a sacrificial lamb at this point because mm -hmm. they can't put anybody, in my opinion, it is not in the party's best interest to put anybody up against Trump right now. Mm-hmm. And sacrifice them is Biden's the only sacrifice. And if Biden happens to win, even better. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's going to be the case, unfortunately, unfortunately for Democrats. Um, also, I have a I have a heavy degree of empathy for Biden because I think his legacy is going to be stained by these years of cognitive decline. Unfortunately. Yeah. And that's what people are going to remember. Totally. And um, yeah. you're I seeing want... it getting lampooned everywhere already. You see the yeah. Kill Tony bit with Shane Gillis and uh... so good. So hilarious. What was the so... other comedian's name? I don't remember. Adam, Adam, uh, Gr Adams, Adam. If you haven't seen it, folks, just Google yeah. on you. Look it up on YouTube. Kill Tony, uh, Trump, Biden. It's hilarious. I mean, Shane Gillis nailed Trump. Oh man, did he? Uh, and with the <laughs> the hand gestures and the dancing and everything, so is good, perfect, so intonation. Good. Yeah, it it skip it's, the sixty second stand ups who come in; they're awful. Skip them. That episode was a struggle. It was like these guys are terrible. Yeah, it was it was a <clears> real <throat> struggle. You know, uh, except when the dude with the little hands came out. I don't know. Um, I just started skipping them after a while. Oh I was like, my okay, God. These are bad. Oh, you know what? I can't, I, I, it's not appropriate for our podcast. Uh, okay. I will talk to, I will talk about it sure. with you after. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it's, it's worth watching just for the Shane Gillis part. I, I thought that, I thought that, I don't, you know, I'm, it's going to be frustrate me. It's, I don't want to, I'm not going to be able to Google his name fast enough because I don't, you know what? I will. <laughs> um, okay so it's shane gillis obviously who yep. did trump and then adam ray right who okay who who did biden but he's also the dude that does dr phil oh is that right okay yeah yeah okay that makes sense yeah um uh, and his his biden gestures with the eyes yes and the and glasses, frozen smile and, and, and then the, the look smile. of fear and, <laughs> and then this one the, i can't even do it and then the... he's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so good was so it good great it's hard you know what ha you know unfortunately for the um for the 60 second you know hat pulls they got you know they got yes. the, the comics that come up they were just on a episode where the guests were the star wow. of the show. Yeah, you couldn't compete. Yeah. Although one did. And like I said, we'll talk about right. that okay. after. Okay, okay, okay. I only watched the first few, and they were all really bad to the point where it's like, one of them has said he, he had been in comedy for like eight years, and it's like, dude, move on. Like, this is not working for you, man. I understand that. But yeah. here's here's my here's my take on that. You're going to have all skill levels. He's been in for eight years, but how long has he actually been working on the craft? Fair. Is is he just getting up there on weekends and yeah. like maybe right. it's eight years, but it's like two years of actual craft work. Right. Um, you know, so like I tried to like 
look at a voice of reason eric not always definitely not in nfts which i do want to talk about yeah okay Uh, hey it's second half of the show let's talk nfts yeah did you see the article or the, the thread that right click the the platform rc.xyz no uh at right click on on twitter they did a thread about uh selling physical art which oh. i thought was appropriate because we had talked about mm-hmm. shipping physical art mm-hmm. what this uh actually was talking about was the relationship between the nft okay and the art itself okay and um i i want to i want to say two things first uh ladies and gentlemen please let's stop saying digital <laughs> it's not happening you're trying hard for years for five years you've been trying to make <laughs> digital happen it's not happening um, i remember when that was the new word yeah it's now an old word uh, yeah. it should be a dead word mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything no it means nothing uh they try it could have meant something it doesn't mean anything mm-hmm. but the point is uh for this article although they use the word fidgetal they <laughs> bring up a couple of things they talk about um uh the when you're selling a physical artwork that comes with an nft right uh where does the originality lie in in terms of the artwork is it the physical piece is it the is it the digital piece? Then they talk about sort of the duplicate aspects of it, right? What if what if the buyer sells the NFT uh, and keeps the physical? And I have a simple simple thought process here, uh, and and basically that's um, and I tweeted this, so some people might uh, might hear might think of it as repetitive, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> A box of raspberries in a database does not get mistaken for the actual raspberries that you eat. Mm -hmm. So logically, we should be able to say with common sense that even though you bought an artwork that's physical in nature using NFT technology, the actual artwork is the physical piece. (laughs) Yeah, okay. The NFT, the token, can be A... Your proof of purchase can be B, your certificate of authenticity, yep. C, both, or D, just the way in which you purchase it from the artist. A signature from the artist? Digital Correct. signature? Correct. It, does, it doesn't need to be this any more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. Now where it gets complicated, and this is where the creative technologists get involved, is when they start mixing these ideas, mm-hmm. which is good. We should test that. But by and large... Most artworks are either a digital file hosted on some server somewhere or a physical artwork, and mm-hmm. they're not doing the the experimentation. So what about in the case of, say, this. ordinals? What about them? Well, in that the actual image is stored on chain as opposed to just being pointed to. Yeah, same thing with the inscriptions. Right. Mm-hmm. Some ordinals, yes. some right. ordinals, yep. not all. Right. Mm-hmm. I think I don't think it's technology specific. I think it's artwork specific, and this is where we need need to start shifting. Mm-hmm. Eathscriptions, as far as I know, is the only one that I'm aware of. But maybe maybe inscriptions as well. Uh, ordinal inscriptions, um, where the where where the the data of the image is hosted mm-hmm. on chain it, and in the call data, right? Yep. Um, Which limits and, the size and so forth, but totally, but that's the experimental yep. nature of this, yes. right? So there are instances where yes, the art is the NFT, mm-hmm. but for most of our life mm-hmm. in this space, the art and the NFT have been two different things. Yes. They're stored on chain. It's a file stored on chain. The innovation was now digital files can be bought and sold and tracked. That was the innovation. Right. Right. 
that was what was so amazing. Yep. Yeah, that was what was so amazing about it. That's what the market was about. Yes. So yeah, okay, you're buying a a digital file. That doesn't mean it's qual. It doesn't mean it's any less. You know, the quality is any less because it's being hosted. In my opinion, being hosted on a service. I mean, you should be backing your shit up anyway. And that's what Club NFT does. Um, it gives you the ability, but most people aren't collecting it at such a rate that you can't just back it up on your own mm. on your own server somewhere this anyway. brings me to a point i was going to talk about from a tweet from jedi wolf are you familiar with jedi wolf mm -hmm. uh it talks about how he came across statements from bitcoin ordinals maxis about the whole known origin shutdown and kind of pointing at ipfs and the flaws of it being stored that way and saying, oh, Bitcoin ordinals are superior because of this. But he made a lot of good points saying, eh, there's, there's issues with ordinals as well. Like, you know, one of the key ones being many in the Bitcoin core dev team actually see ordinals as an attack, as a, as a negative. Yeah. And who knows what happens in the future with core updates that perhaps do something to eliminate accessibility to those works it's vulnerable to shut down as well of course of course and these are all things um that users should be aware of mm -hmm. you know it is interesting though because i remember there was a time where i was quite naive about it i was like oh yeah this is immutable permanent my art's going to be stored on chain forever right and it's like well the token will be stored on chain right which is the which is the whole point which is the uh -huh. whole point the uh -huh. token <laughs> the token is the thing that we use for ver we say the nft but it's used conceptually for various things it's used for proof of purchase it's used for uh certificate of authenticity it's used for provenance it could be used for all three at once. It could be used for two at once. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like, here's an example I was thinking about with the physical art. Let's say, let's say I buy a physical art piece of artwork from you and it come and I buy it via an NFT and it's also the certificate of authenticity, right? But then I lose that wallet. You can re-authenticate it for me. Sure, yeah. From my wallet. From your wallet. Prove that it's from the artist. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that aspect, it is literally just a certificate of authenticity mm -hmm. where the proof of purchase now is now lies with the original, you know, like the receipt now lies with the original NFT. Mm -hmm. right but the certificate of authenticity now is you authenticating it mm -hmm. now if i sell that that becomes the proof of purchase for somebody else right so like it's not hard and fast anymore mm -hmm. as we once thought it was it's not as immutable the system isn't as immutable as we uh i think naively potentially thought all of it was what i loved about the article the thread in in particular was that it's bringing up things that, that we're going to have to deal with, mm. but I don't think art people are the right people to, to talk about supply chain issues. I think supply <laughs> chain experts <laughs> that makes uh, sense should come in and uh, be the ones to, you know, throw some uh, expert advice or figure that stuff out. Yeah. And I don't think it's that. I don't think, I think the, I don't think logically, I don't think it's that difficult. Mm. Like the physical artwork is the artwork, mm -hmm. unless by some manifestation of a creative output, uh, the NFT and the artwork need to be together in order for it to be considered the entire artwork because of an integration that happens right. with technology. Wise. Sure. But there aren't many artists experimenting with that particular integration. Right. Like like the art, like like the physical doesn't work without the 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 digital, 
right? Right. This is not very common. Yeah. No, no, mm-hmm. it's not. And an NFC chip doesn't constitute working with the physical, in my opinion. Not really, no. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of another thing I was going to bring up was a person who goes by the name Artifaction Squared yeah. on Twitter, which is just A R T I F A C T I O N 2. Mm-hmm. Aren't they Noble Gallery? Is that them? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And they were showing uh, a lenticular print, which is one where when you're looking at it and you move, you see different frames of the image. And I thought that's such a cool way to convert a GIF to a physical because all the frames of the GIF are on the print. And to see the different frames of the GIF, you just have to move your head and you can see the full loop. So it's a physical manifestation of an animated GIF and it yeah. looks awesome because it's a literally a physical GIF. Um, I, I recommend having a look at it if you haven't seen it. It just looks beautiful. So he, they have an example on here um, from the Noble Gallery that is showing a, a glitch art, a GIF art piece of a this skull with uh, different strokes that are in motion as you move and look around at it i thought i've never seen that before where it was a gif converted to a print like that we're starting to see a shift where uh, artists are or shift in attention mm-hmm. where 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 physical artwork whether print or um or physical original uh, are are becoming more desired yeah yeah is that an, ad- an admission that the nft movement has failed in one way or another god no no fit what's fit it's to no i'm just asking a question no i mean that's i know i, I want to react because i feel like you're not you're not speaking from you you're speaking in terms of like what people might say and yep. so them, i would say like we got to this point because of the NFT movement. So it's not a failure, mm-hmm. right? It, we, the ex, oh, the experimentation brought us to this point. Mm-hmm. So no, not at all. We're going to see continued experimentation. I just think we're going to see expansion as well. And that's great. That's great. More artists should, should you yourself are, are considering physical work. Um, what I struggle between is should I just be making digital work that I then print physically? Because I feel most comfortable creating stuff digitally. Or should I stretch myself and make actual physical pieces? I did pick up some canvases the other day. So my first step is to just draw on them and sketch things out, right? What if... Um, But I don't know if I'll feel as comfortable with that. I just feel so comfortable with the Mm -hmm. digital medium. Is that a good thing? Should I be uncomfortable? It's probably good to be uncomfortable. It is. It is. There's a bridge here, though. Mm -hmm. You could do your sketch digital, have it printed on a canvas, and then paint on the canvas. Hmm. So you could bridge both. I know an artist that does that. Um, How are they printing it on the canvas? Like, like you would. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Hmm, interesting yeah, there there are people that can that that could uh get you can get canvas prints and then stretch sure. them on a yeah i see yeah. what you're saying you do your base print and then you paint on top of that yeah yeah hmm that's an interesting thought yeah yeah i've been thinking i've been trying to figure out what's what's next for me i haven't released anything in a long time mm-hmm. <laughs> but um I'm okay with that. I've been, I was struggling with, and and I think, I think this comes from being in this frenetic NFT space Mm. where if you're not, if you're not creating, you're dying sort of like mentality or if you're not, sometimes you need to take a break though. If you're not minting, you're dying. I'm Mm. always creating. Uh, mm-hmm. always 
but if you're not minting your dying is is sort of this you know i think it's okay to take a break too though if you're not feeling it yeah of course yeah yeah and, and i've i've been take i since november uh -huh. i uh been taking a break basically and uh -huh. i feel it feels good you know yeah i've been taking a break from minting i have lots of things that i have been working on experimenting with uh -huh. um I have been I've embodying I've been embodying this idea of moving in silence. Uh the idea that I don't owe anybody explanations, the idea that uh I can create things for myself. Mm -hmm. Uh which kind of went I went away from with second round because I was like how and this is I I I talk about killing second round a lot because it was for a long time a part of my identity sure uh but it became about how do i make things that sell and mm. and that was just the wrong way for me to approach art and i had to mm -hmm. i had mm -hmm. to you know encapsulate it and capture it in a in that little you know that that second realm world um mm -hmm. i learned a lot you know and i think as with any technology like we were talking about before, the NFTs is shifting. As an artist, the technology is getting expanded. Technology is being used for other things. Uh, as NFT as just an art thing is gone. Yeah. Right? As as just a digital collectible thing is gone. It, it's going to expand to more and more and more. Uh, but will those things continue to exist? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. What what greater what better way if you're if you're creating IP and you're a cartoonist or whatever, what better way to get people excited about you know your potential future uh animation that's gonna be on like Nick at Night or some you know Comedy Central or something like that than by beginning young and generating interest through pfp stuff totally yeah or collectibles of whatever sort like you talked about Collecti that one yeah. previously with uh baseball um or no totally. basketball sorry yeah which uh do you mind if i switch topics is that okay mm -hmm. we've got a very interesting week coming up in the uh crypto industry with Donald Trump at the Bitcoin conference, um, Ethereum ETFs potentially launching Tuesday, July 23rd is the date they're saying now. Uh, there's five of them that are set to launch. Could be an extremely, so extremely bullish week. Uh, having said that, the last time around when Big Spot Bitcoin ETFs launched, they dumped because of Grayscale. And Grayscale also has an Ethereum trust. Uh, but they also have a mini uh, ETF. I don't know if you know about this. No, I don't know what that is. Well, Grayscale holds a trust in which you couldn't redeem your shares. You basically were just holding them there. Um, but now that ETF is open, they're converting it into an ETF. Problem being, Grayscale is setting their fee on that ETF very high, 10 times higher than any of the other ETFs. But simultaneously, they've set up a mini spot Ethereum ETF, which will be at a highly competitive fee of 0.15%. And they expect many people will move their Ethereum from the one to the other, but some of it could result in some big outflows again. That's what happened with the Grayscale spot, spot Bitcoin ETF. A lot of people took theirs out because Grayscale's fees were so high that short term, it resulted in like a 20% drop in price. Now, of course, that was gobbled up within a few weeks but there's always this interesting dynamic of like is this actually going to be bullish or is this uh a crash after you know it's the buy the rumor sell the news situation um so it's an interesting week it's very hard to predict where prices are going to go with it um again long-term bullish but who knows what happens over these next two three weeks with the theory with ethereum so explain can you explain to me the mechanics again? Because so there's there is a trust that people it's converting into an ETF. 
And in that particular trust, they deliberately raised. They have high fees. Kept the fees high. But you could then transfer it to a, a mini ETF. Yeah. Now, I'm no expert on this. I'm not like some Bloomberg analyst or something. Yeah. But my impression is Grayscale has also set up a mini spot ETF, which was, I don't know wh- exactly why it's called mini, and someone can fill me in on that if they want to. Okay. Uh, but it's at a much lower fee, like 0.15%, which is lower than anyone else. And so I think their goal is to get everyone to move over to this new ETF. I'm not sure why. Why didn't um, they just convert the trust into a mini I don't ETF? know. I think they're making a killing on those fees as people move their stuff around. So it gives them a bit of a... Uh, a slush fund for a few weeks here. I got you. Because Grayscale's sense. had their their financial issues. So maybe this is a way for them to recoup some of those costs. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, it, you know, some people are saying it will create rage outflows where people are just ticked off with Grayscale and just remove their, their funds maybe. from the ETH ETF, the Grayscale one. Many people will end up switching over to the BlackRock one because that's the big one. You know, mm-hmm. but it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it doesn't have the same, again, it does not have the same selling pressure as Bitcoin does. It doesn't have miners. It doesn't have things like Mt. Gox. It doesn't have those kinds of things to press down on the price. So if there is an outflow from Grayscale, I don't see it being as impactful as it was in Bitcoin's case. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, like you this could is see my, a ten percent drop, maybe. But this is this is my weakest area of knowledge, uh, mm. and so I rely on you to be my like, you know. There's just so many bullish factors though at the same time. Like you've got Trump speaking at the Bitcoin conference on Friday, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's more bullish than that? He he's rumored to actually suggest to propose that the United States. Uh, set up a Bitcoin reserve. <laughs> I mean, That's what he's rumored to propose. Now, that doesn't mean it'll happen. I yeah. mean, politicians say crap all the time. That doesn't materialize. I mean, but that sounds even, like a good thing to say. Even just saying it would be tremendously bullish for Bitcoin. Sure. Sure. And we all know if it goes to Bitcoin, it flows to Ethereum. It's just the way it works. Yeah. Well, we brought it back to politics, so I'll, I'll say this: um, I think the the Fed, I think the Fed, um, will be very weary of having a reserve, um, and it would take a multi-decade campaign in order to switch out of the current fiat system. Mm-hmm. So, do do I think that we're going to, like, that sounds good, Trump? You can't make it happen in four years. That's no. just Having impossible. said that, I mean, there's a point now for a lot of people where they're looking and going, okay, is it more risky to invest in Bitcoin or to not invest in Bitcoin? Which is actually more risky? Mm-hmm. Right? And it's coming to a point where people are going, hmm, you know what? I think it might be more risky to not have any. Yeah, I have uh, uh, my, yeah. I regret selling my Bitcoin, mm-hmm. uh, but I did sell it at the top. There you go. So I made a I made a good chunk. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, as I've said in the past, I am I am not a smart trader. I I don't have the like. That's not my str- that's not my strength. Okay. Um, I'm creative. That's that's yeah, that's fair. Strongest. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just, all I'm saying is there's a lot of very interesting dynamics at play in this next week. Well, what do you, what, what's your takeaway from like, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're an artist whose strength isn't in the trading world, mm-hmm. right? What's your recommendation? You're not, let's say this is purely just buy ETFs yeah. and, and hold them. Yeah. I would, I mean, I would rather buy, the the me i would rather buy the the token i'm just saying for the casual person who's not yeah. super into all the logistics and technicalities of it it's yeah, far yeah. safer 
far safer. Yeah, also, you have to deal with less in terms of uh, taxes and all that kind of stuff. So Totally. It's just yeah. more like, obviously, you're not having personal custody of it. And that is kind of one of the major principles of it. But for the casual investor, I yeah. just don't think that's a big priority. It's not. What they want to see is price go up. Yeah, it's an investment. Yeah. Right? Just buy and hodl. Yeah. Interesting. So, wild week. Yep. Oh, wild, wild week. We went really heavy on the politics. It's okay. <laughs> it's the rising tide. We don't, it's, uh, and that's, that, that was a topic that affected uh, not just America, but all of the, all of, I would say, and anybody who's interested in American politics, an assassination of potential this is pretty major news is big news yeah so yep well and again i i think it doesn't actually matter who biden's campaign who the democrats put up they're going to lose to trump the only which is why they're going to put biden up the only person i think could beat trump is michelle obama and i really don't see her running i could see them convince her potentially but she's the only person i can see beating trump Mm. I would love, love, love for uh, Obama, Barack Obama to come out and go again. That would be, wow, Obama versus Trump. That would be epic. Right. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. He did his eight years. I think he's done. I think Michelle's done too. I don't think she's interested. It could be quite the story. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yep. Who knows? Maybe we're breaking. Maybe again, we are we are arbiters of culture and change on this podcast. Yep. What happens in the next three days could be uh, amazing. I am not surprised if they if they turn to Obama in this situation. I'm not it surprised. Would be the only Hail Mary. Yeah, he's the only one that he or I think Barack or Michelle, either one of them, could potentially beat him. Yeah. Have a great Ladies week, and gentlemen. Have a good weekend. Take care. <laughs>